coming up next on today's DC Radio. And she just said, can I pray for you? And he said, sure. She just prayed a simple prayer, just said, Father, in the name of Jesus. She said he started jumping up and down and saying, it doesn't hurt anymore. Look, I can, I can jump on it. I can, you know, you know, you can't deny that kind of stuff. Log on your computer, turn up your radio. The truth is spoken. Real radio, real internet radio. Once again, the truth. Welcome back to DC Radio. Haven't been here for a while. This is Daryl Chesser, but I am back here today with a very special guest in downtown Matthews. And his name is Don Chanel. Welcome, Don. Thank you, sir. Good to be with you. Don and I have known each other in our entire lives, but we didn't really meet each other until much later in our lives. That's one way to put it. And uh, and I know that sounds weird, but I mean, you know, our circle of friends, you start talking and family members and church relations and places we've lived, you're going, oh my yeah. gosh, yeah, I know him and you. So we've known yeah. each other for all our lives almost. Yeah, well, in fact, uh, one of our recent conversations a few weeks back, I uh, found out that you know my family from down in Tampa. Yeah, what's his name? Your whole uh, Verdo. Oh, and, Verdo, and, and, Chanel, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so uh, it's kind of weird, you know, um, how a lot of people run in the same circles, have the same friends, but just never meet until, you know, at some point in the future. And so there it is. So a quick history. Uh, like I say, my guest is what I call a barb. Uh, he's uh, been around the block <laughs> and, and so in the Christian world. And uh, uh, he's just done, he's pastored, he's music director, he's audio guy, he's camera guy, he, whatever you need, he's a bass player. Don't hold that against him. He's actually a pretty <laughs> nice guy. And, uh, but he's kind of all around, whatever it is you need done, he can get done. And uh, so when we started hooking up and talking and laughing and discussing scripture and world politics and stuff, uh, I found no fault in the guy except for one thing. I mean, he's sitting here in an Alabama shirt and hat, you know? Roll Tide. That's all oh, I want to say. Roll Tide. So hey, sad. Uh, uh, just, just, just for the, uh, the listener's sake, I have to tell you, when I was doing a little stint at uh, ESPN, I was micing up Tim Tebow, you know, famous. Yeah, Ooh, everybody Gators. loves Gators. Yeah, Florida Gators. And, uh, you know, Tebow is a pretty strong Christian, and he was, uh, he was in the studio doing some stuff for the SEC Network, and <clears throat> I was micing him up, and I was just had I had to pick at him because he you know, was standing there while I'm putting his mic on. He's doing his social media stuff on his phone, and I said, "Now, Tim, you know I really appreciate you know your your standing for Christ, and you know understand you're a Gator Nation kind of a guy, and I respect that and all." I said, "But you you do understand that the only way to get to heaven is to come <laughs> is to come through that crimson flow." Uh, and he just um, <laughs> let's just say if looks could kill, and that's that's all I'm gonna say. That's all I'm gonna say. Crimson flow, God forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, the only worst thing could be if, if you told me you're like going for the Patriots Sunday. Oh, no, no, I, you, you, I'm good there. I'm okay. good there. I'm, I'm kind of like, like the opposite on the NFL spectrum of the college thing, you know. You know, we're kind of like the Patriots of college football. Yeah. You know, we're the ones that, you know, win more than everybody else. So everybody hates yeah. us, gets tired of seeing us up there. Of course, we love it. Yeah. You know, but I'm kind of the flip side. It's like, okay, let's let the Eagles win one. Uh, I'm tired of seeing Brady. You know, Belichick is just such a Mike hog. You know, <laughs> and he just, you know, he just goes so overboard emotionally with his wins and everything. It's like, okay, put somebody up there that's going to act like they really are excited about winning it. So, yeah, I'm good. So who is it you go for in the, in the uh, professional ranks? Well, you know, uh, and, and not, not because of the Christian uh, – connection of sorts but um i'm a saints fan ah huh. yeah uh, see i get it saints and, saints yeah and, but but you know yeah no pun intended yeah but yeah seriously saints fan sure. no, it's not a bad team i mean the guys uh obviously with drew Brees there in the last oh, few yeah. years man they're they're i was disappointed that they lost to the eagles i believe yeah lost, right know. right yeah well and 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 you know i think one of the um I'm one of those guys that, um, you know, I really appreciate historic moments and the way things that just sort of gel and it's almost like, okay, that almost had to be kind of a moment. 
And, uh, you know, for them to win the, um, you know, the world championship following the Katrina catastrophe, yeah. we did a lot of post-Katrina work. Actually, we did a lot of work with churches and one church in particular in, uh, in New Orleans before Katrina, so already had relationships there and stuff. But after Katrina, when we went back down to help and spend time with this church and, and the people of New Orleans and got, just really had a feel for what was going on there, uh, on a social and a spiritual and political, governmental, every kind of level, uh, economic level. It was just, it was real devastation. But, you know, what I saw that win for them do to the spirit of that community to come back after a disaster like that and win a world championship when the Saints never have been one of those that you kind of expected to even be in the playoffs, much less make it to the big one, much less win it. That was really... That was really kind of special. That's kind of what solidified me. I grew up in Alabama, obviously, in Tuscaloosa, and um, you know, no professional football in mm-hmm. in, uh, in Alabama, but uh, well, just kind Alabama. of yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Except for the fact that we, you know, Save send it. most of the players is to is professional football, you know. But except for that, so what church was it you were affiliated with or uh, helped work with there? I was a church called uh, God's House, West Bank Cathedral. Uh, Chip and Polly Radke, the pastors. Polly uh, passed away from cancer just a few years ago, and um, but they, um, yeah, they're over on the West Bank, across the other side of the river from New Orleans. But yeah, just a good group of people, good group of folks, and uh, just really makes you know. I just a, a lot of people I know, um, especially in um, in ministry, I've run ac- I've run across quite a few people, Daryl, that you know, kind of are down on New Orleans because it's such a wicked city, or you know, Party Central or Mardi Gras or Bourbon Street or whatever. But uh, I'll tell you, having traveled to 43 different countries in the world and seen a lot of different cultures and what Christianity really looks like, a worldview of Christianity, uh, New Orleans really is one of the most unique cities in the world but and in and, and, and America. And those people are different. They are different, oh, you know. Yeah. They're, but their history goes back further than almost any, especially in the South, goes yeah. way back further than most cities in the South. And it's a different culture. It's a different feel. It is. But by the same token, um, there's a lot of people down there that really love the Lord. Yeah. And um, and uh, it's a shame that New Orleans, uh, the greater New Orleans area, gets the uh, the bad press that it does in the religious community because of one street. Uh, or one festival, because there's a lot of people that really love the Lord, and a lot of good things going on, a lot of good ministry in that town, and we, we, Kathy and I, really, we really enjoy being down there. Yeah. Well, all I know is where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Thank you and that good night. Is ready for revival, right there. There you go. And I've had I've had people ask me that know how much time we have spent in New Orleans over the last probably uh, uh, 12, 14 years. Um, you know, ask me you know what I think about it and all, and and. Most of the time, I guess they're expecting me to give some kind of a negative report. But, you know, I just I come away from there going, you know, there's a lot of places um, in America that you go that it's very hard to tell. (laughs) You know, there's a lot of gray. Let's just let's just call it that way. It's a lot of gray. Uh, And in some places, I I prefer black and white. I, I, I almost prefer to see. Hot or cold, baby. Uh, 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 yeah, exactly. Because the American culture church, and we've talked about this a lot, you know, has become a subculture of, of American culture rather than a counterculture. And I like counterculture because it's easy to see black and white, wrong and right. And I don't mean that in a judgmental way. I yeah. just mean that being able to see true righteousness from evil yeah. and how God can invade the darkness and overcome it with his light and with his love. So I... I've just gotten, you know, at 60 years old, I've gotten to where I kind of prefer those environments over the ones where you're still having to guess. Now, wait a minute, what is, what is this we're looking at here? Is it, you know, it's 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 a really nice shade of gray, but what is it real? Is it fake? What is it? And having to ferret through all that stuff versus going, okay, Bourbon Street is sin. You, you don't have to guess about that. It doesn't take a ton of yeah. discernment, you know. Okay, whatever. But by the same token... Um, seeing the power of God move in situations like that and uh, people's lives be transformed and, you know, just um, the, the, the church down there has people in it, uh, the one I'm talking about, God's house. You know, there's people in that church that, uh, you know, were, you know, former strippers and former hookers and, you know, different, you know, things that in religions, 
viewpoint would be like, oh, you know, but yet you read your Bible and, you know, here's this. So how do I sign up for this ministry? <laughs> <laughs> you just go, Daryl. You just get in your car or an airplane and you just fly down there. Yeah, but it's, but, you know, it's just beautiful to see those kind of transformations of people that were, you know, stuck in the mire of obvious yeah. and, and, and blatant sin and that Jesus comes in and transforms their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of my big concerns, as we've talked about many times, about what we do, the gospel we preach in the American church. It's uh, so much of it is salvation without transformation. So to see somebody's life and a testimony that says, I was, but now here's who yeah. I am, what I am, you know. You can see why uh, he's such a tough interview, and I wasn't looking forward to this. He just hardly says anything. <laughs> I'm like having to think and do all the all the carrying the carrying the water here, brother. But I can do it. I'm a, hey, listen, I owe you quite a few. I owe you quite a few though, because you've carried me a bunch of times on some of those Sunday afternoon meetings that we've had around the area. You know, with men's groups and stuff. And uh, you know, I could just pretty much say, "Hey, let's talk about." And you know, an hour later, go, "Thanks, Daryl." Yeah, and he's very polite. He didn't say shut the heck up and don't come to the next one. <laughs> See, I enjoyed it. We're just we're just we're just trading places now. Is all we're doing. You know? uh, so let's talk worldview in light of that. Uh, you and I discussed this um, over several meetings. We just wandered into this area, the church, and it's changing. I mean, it's already changed, but mm -hmm. it, it's like the warm water, the frog in the water. Yeah, we we. We go on with church, and it's good. I'm not slamming it. I'm just saying, where is church going? Where is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ going? Is it going to stay the same? Are we going to see something different? Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's really one of the main questions, if not the main question, that at least in American culture we have to ask ourselves. You know, you've, you've been around the world yourself, and it's amazing to go into different countries and see how the church and how Christianity looks in different cultures. I heard a guy say something years ago, a guy that used to have a big campus, college campus ministry called, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but anyway, Bob Weiner is his name. You may have heard of him, but anyway. Unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I heard Bob say something years ago that really stuck with me. One of those things, I didn't even have to write it down. I, it, when he said it, I knew I would remember it for the rest of my life. He said, any gospel that cannot be preached at any time in history, in any country or culture, socioeconomic group, anywhere, at any time, to any people, is not the true gospel. Yeah. Now, when he said that, it was somewhere back around, I would say, 1990. And things at that time were starting to make some turns. When we were, I think we've, we've, we've made some pretty big turns since then in the church in America, and some in a good way, some in a not-so-good way. But I remember looking at, looking at that mentally, taking what he said and, and trying to wrap my head around it, and, and it just hit me in my gut so hard. I'm not sure I heard much of anything he said after that because I was just dumbfounded by, by the simplicity of what he said, but yet how profoundly true it was that the gospel doesn't have to make adjustments. It, the true gospel can penetrate any people group at any time during history. Yeah. And if it's not that, I agreed with him. It's not the true gospel. And all of a sudden I realized, oh dear God, how much of what I believe, preach, practice, or what we're doing in the American church. Um, I mean, you look at a lot of what you would hear in Christian media, on radio, on TV, in churches. How much of that could you take that and go preach it verbatim in the Amazon jungle or in the, you know, you know out on the Serengeti in Africa? Mm -hmm or in a Muslim country, or, you know, how, how much of, of what was said that we listened to or that we said in a sermon or in a teaching of our form of Christianity in America, how much of that could you take to other parts of the world yeah. and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it would reach those people and they could connect to it? Yeah. And that's where my concern is, is have we become such a subculture 
that there is nothing counterculture to our message that really uh, draws a line in the sand. Again, not to condemn people for, for their for their sin, but by the same opportunity to to show yeah. the difference between this is why Jesus came was for sinners yeah. to be able to change, to be transformed, to be born again yeah. into the kingdom of light, to come out of darkness and into the light. You know, you and I both were raised in um, in some traditional circles, you know, in denominations and stuff growing Church up. Church of God. Like, Church of God, that's Ooh. right. And, um, and you know, there was a lot of things um, that, that we were raised in that, you know, that as time went on, we realized that a lot of the legalism and a lot of the exteriors and stuff that were, were emphasized, you know, 40, 50 years ago, um, you know, were just not really necessarily true, you know, that, a, you know, if a woman wears a pair of pants, she's not going to go to hell. Um, you know, and, and we, we dropped a lot of those things that were, um, that, that were, there were extremes, you know, which all, everybody's going to, you know, let's just face it, let's admit it, um, all denominations, all groups tend to get off into extremes in order to protect their piece yeah. of the pie and what mm-hmm. they teach and everything. Yeah. But having, having said that, I, I remember um, um, a good friend of mine, a guy named Mark Jacobs, that's gone to be with the Lord. That was uh, my oldest and one of the closest friends. Wait a second. Are any of your friends living? Uh, no, pre- uh, yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. We're talking about two people so far. We're talking about two people. She's gone to be with the Lord. Yeah, everybody's and, dead. This guy's now. gone to the Lord. Yeah, I'd see uh, you know. I'm, well, thanks for tuning in, folks. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, messages from the grave. <laughs> but anyway, but uh, I remember Mark saying years ago, you know, because he, he was church God as well, uh, minister and pastor down in Mobile, and um, and I remember him saying, I'm, I'm, I'm. He, he would say in our private conversations a lot of time. He'd say, Don, I'm, I'm really afraid that in getting rid of a lot of the extremes, we also threw a lot of the real, and and the true Some away the with you. Yeah, threw the baby out with the bathwater to yeah. a certain degree. And um, of course, he had a real heart for revival and renewal. But um, yeah, I think for me, that's kind of where I'm at with American Culture Church right now. Is I just really want to see a renewal and a revival um, come that that brings us back to the place to where what we have stands in stark contrast mm-hmm. to the world, yeah. and says there's there's still um, a way to be transformed. You know, I, I think one of the old ways I used to say it 20 years ago was I used to say, and I hear other people say it this way, they say, uh, you know, to a great degree, a lot of people have accepted Jesus as their Savior, but not as their Lord. Yeah. You know, um, maybe, a, maybe a more um, contemporary way of saying that would be to say that we, you know, we, we, we've kind of gotten to where everything is comfort driven. And, um, and I love to be as positive as anybody else. And I do believe that we do need positive encouragement and you can make it and, and, you know, messages of hope and everything, but there has to be a, there has to be a point, you know, of departure where we look at, okay, this is what the Bible defines as not saved, not born again. And this is the things that John and Paul and many of the writers of the New Testament said, we know we are we are in him and he is in us because we obey his commandments. And a lot of the things that have just kind of been thrown to the curb in terms of just trying to make everybody feel good. And I, I keep running into people left and right, have been on phone conversations this week, have a, have some appointments with people in the next few days to minister to some folks uh, where they love God and they believe in the power, the transforming power of God, but they're in those in, in that little situation where it's like, okay, what I believe God can do versus what I'm seeing him actually do in my life or in my loved one's life, where is the disconnect? And what, what does it take to reconnect us with something that is so transformational? I was talking to a lady the other day, a friend of mine, she said, I was just in Walmart the other day. And she said, I was just in line and so a bunch of people behind me. And she said, I walked up to the guy that was um, checking me out and and, uh, you know, I could tell he looked like he was kind of in pain. And I asked him, he said, what's wrong? And he's, he said, uh, he said, well, my leg, my leg. I mean, he described this medical problem he had with his leg. And it was, you know, it was something that was causing him a lot of pain and discomfort. And she just said, can I pray for you? And he said, sure. And so she just prayed a very simple 
you know, she didn't get all loud and crazy and drawing attention to herself. She just prayed a simple prayer, just said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for this man and just command his leg to be made whole. And I mean instantly, instantly, he was healed. And he was he was the one that started drawing the attention. He started, she said he started jumping up and down and saying, I can't believe it. My leg is healed. It's 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 healed. I, it's it doesn't hurt anymore. Look, I can I can jump on it. I can you know, you know you can't deny that kind of stuff, you know. So where is that in our everyday? Not just in our church services per se, but where is it in our everyday life that the the transforming power of Christ goes out there? And you know you don't have to talk to that guy very much about God being real. You know that's the way my wife even reminded me the other day some things that she was. Uh, had been up uh, before I was and was praying and reading some things in the Word. She said, you know, she said, I just can't get past the fact that Jesus did two things all the time. He preached the kingdom of God is at hand and he performed miracles. Kingdom of God is at hand <laughs> and healed people. Kingdom of God is at hand, cast out devils. Kingdom of God is at hand. And it was always the gospel with something that was an obvious, irrefutable, so, I mean, the, you know, really ticked the Sanhedrin off. You know, they pull this guy in. Now, who is this guy? That, what do you mean? And they all knew he'd been blind since birth. They knew he'd never seen, that he was a beggar. And, you know, and they didn't like the fact that Jesus healed him, but they couldn't deny the fact. And I love the man's response where he just says, look, I, I can't tell you exactly how or what happened. or the, All I know is one thing. I was blind. Now I see. So where is that? That's, that's darkness and light. No pun intended because of his eyes being healed. I mean, that's darkness and light. That's, that's I was, but now I am, you know. And what does it take to get us back to that? Just the average everyday, not superstar ministries or big mega churches, just the everyday person, you know, um, out there just living their life, going through a Walmart checkout line and praying for some guy, and he gets healed, <laughs> you know. Okay, I'm back. I went out to the bathroom for a minute. And uh, did I miss anything? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> in fact, I'm going to, like, I need to go get another Coke. So let me ask you a question. You take it. <laughs> I'm, I'm just messing with you. That's awesome. That's awesome stuff. Um, a, a little side note. On one of the things you said earlier about the gospel being preached anywhere, like uh, in, in the jungles, it, the same gospel, right, should be preached everywhere. Uh, and just a side note, I, I remember when I was growing up and we'd have missionaries come in and stuff like that, you get to talk to them, and, and you hear statements like this. This is not all of them. This is just anecdotal, a couple, three, you know. Well, we, we can't preach the same thing over there. You know, like we don't preach tithing or any of that because they don't have anything to give. And it always stunned me because I'm going like, Wait a minute, you know the gospel's not a Western thing, right? It's if you can't preach the whole gospel there, I mean, who needs tithing more? You know what? You're in a village, you got nothing, and you're not taught, like, man, you know, give give ten beans of your hundred, right? <laughs> yeah. And just bless the Lord, bless yeah, the things community, relative. whatever. And maybe you'll get a hundred beans. You know, it starts increasing. Uh, so it is that was just a little note to me that I'm going, dude, if you're going over there looking down on them, mm -hmm. that you need to dumb down the message for your audience. I'm going, I don't get that. Um, what is it we read in, in Paul's writings? He says it is the gospel that is the power of God. Mm -hmm. Not my doctrine, right. not my passion, but the gospel. It's not the intellectual display of your your, your theology or your great revelation. It is, look, you preach Jesus Christ. You preach what he preached. You say what he said. You, you do what he do. And the gospel is what saves people. Mm -hmm. It's what heals people. It's what brings people to restoration and heals people's lives. And uh, I, I'm totally on board with you. That was a great saying that the guy had. If, yeah. you, if you preach the same message wherever you're at, consistency, and, and, of course, the central theme of that is, is the gospel is Jesus Christ, coming to Christ. That's where all the sick people came to. That's where all the people that get saved, it, you come into Christ. That was the central theme. That is the gospel. Come to Christ. 
Let this begin to transform your life. Supernatural things happen. Yeah. And a simple prayer, like you said, no display, no no magic, you know, woo. Yeah. But just a simple, I pray that you heal him and like I command you to be whole. And boom, done. Yeah. Done. She was probably as amazed as anybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, she's jumping up and down with him going, wow, it actually happened. Well, and, and let me say this about the tithe thing, too. You know, uh, again, I think that's a really good uh, point and counterpoint where our culture is concerned in the American church, where a minister would feel like I can't preach tithing because they don't have any money to give. Okay, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, let's go back to tithing for a second. Okay, number one, uh, you know, a lot of people will shoot me for this one, but you know, tithing, um, bring all the tithe into the storehouse was a, it, it was a, it was a, let's improve the temple project. Okay. If you, I heard one guy years ago that uh, a guy that knew scripture a whole lot better than me went back into the old Testament and he added up somehow, I don't know how he got these figures, but he, but he went into the, the original Hebrew, understood the culture and yada, yada. And he went through all the stuff and he added up what their offerings, you know, their heave offering, their, you know, drink offering, their other, and they added up all this stuff that they were required to do every year under the law. And he said it added up to more than 30% of their income. Um, well, look at what they were doing. They were bringing grain. They were bringing animals. It wasn't money they were bringing for their offerings, okay? And of course, I know that, you know, again, the culture back then and everything. It was more of a barter system and yeah. things like that. But what about, well, in America, what what is the number one thing in Western culture? Now, let me let me use a spiritual term. What is the spirit of mammon? What is what is the world system? What is the number one thing in the world system? It's money. money. It's mo the love of money. Yeah. Okay. And so in American culture, we have been subtly deceived into believing that tithe is all about money. And it's easy to do that because most people go trade their time. I'm going somewhere with time. Time for money, yeah. and then they give a tenth That's of their money is. to yeah. the thing. But listen to this. If you're in Africa and you're somewhere preaching to people who don't have any money, I've said this, heard this said and repeated it and believe it like I'm sitting here talking to you, that the most valuable commodity, you know, commodity being something that can be bought, sold, or traded, the most valuable commodity we have in life is time. Yeah. So if you don't have any money, I can still preach tithing to you and say, what do you have to bring to him? They brought grain, they brought corn, they brought animals, whatever, it, for their offerings. Okay, what do you have? Well, I don't have any money. You got any time? You know, well, we live in a poor place and it's, you know, there's just not a lot of jobs and I'm kind of unemployed. Guess what you got on your hand? You may not have money in your hand, but you got time on your hand. Okay, can you tithe a tenth of your, can you give 2.4 hours a day to ministry and to the church and to the needs of others and that kind of thing? Okay, well, then okay, yeah, that's a gospel that can be preached in any culture. And so to say, I can't preach tithing over there tells me that what you're preaching is not completely the true gospel. Because again, it's cross-cultural. It spans all time, all people groups, all socioeconomic groups. So I can preach the gospel and on that one particular point, take that same principle and use it dozens of times to go down everything else that we preach or don't preach or would think that we have to add or take away from our message in America, okay, well, what we need to do is get back in, to our message and go, okay, wait a minute, that didn't, I couldn't preach that over there, so there's something wrong. Yeah. I need to look at that. I need to examine it. I need to go back to Scripture. And I know this is a novel idea. Okay, this is, this is, this is way out there in left field. Okay, you ready? You ready? Radical. Ask the Lord huh. to show you where your theology or your doctrine or your gospel is off. That's what I started doing yeah. after I heard him say that in 1990. I looked at the Lord and I said, okay, gut me. Gut me like a fish on the riverbank. You know, anything that's not the true gospel, take it out. And that began a journey for me that became pretty radical. And I started ticking off a lot of people, not meaning to, and and uh, got ostracized some and got, uh, you know, 
thumbs down from a lot of people and stuff because all of a sudden the more things that I took out of my gospel that were not re the real gospel and conversely the more things that I added to my gospel. You know, Paul talked about, he said my gospel. He was talking about this is, this is it, it's the gospel but it takes on a personal yeah. thing. It, it's a responsibility. It's not, it's not your possession, it's your responsibility. I have a responsibility to prove my gospel has to be the gospel. Okay, Lord, what is in my gospel that is not the gospel? And if we really do that, I mean, from ground up, go back to go back to the foundation, to the to the to the to the ground floor of American Christianity, and start over again, and say, "Okay, guys, <laughs> well, you know what, what what needs to go, and what needs to come, to make what we preach and what we do and what we practice the real thing," you know. And that sounds easy, but it you know, but that's that's a pretty transformational. And I'll say this too about um, the whole thing about revival. There's a lot of people. You know, um, I don't, I'm not sure if we're supposed to date this thing, but here we are in February of 18 doing this radio program. But here we are in February of, of, of 2018. Um, and I'm, I'm just kind of looking at, at American culture and going, okay, um, we are in a social and economic and political massive upheaval and change. That makes a lot of people uncomfortable makes a lot of people uncomfortable. I like it because it means things are in motion. Yeah. Things are in motion. And while some of it's negative and some of it's positive, the bottom line is it means something is moving. You know, the old saying, you can't drive a car unless it's moving. You know, get it moving. Well, things are moving in our, in our culture, and it's an awesome time for the church to say, okay, while things are moving, while things are in an upheaval and in in, in are in motion, now's a great time for us to say, okay, we need to be giving the answers. You know, Donald Trump, like him, love him, hate him, indifferent, whatever. He's not the answer. Jesus yeah. always has been the answer. Yes. So are we giving our society and our uh, government and our nation what it needs right now to say, okay, yeah, there's some adjustments we need to make. Um, and yeah, it's going to be affected uh, where the government, where the economy, where society, where there are all kinds of social issues are concerned. But where is the truth? And is our gospel actually relative to and, and, and specifically addressing those issues and giving answers that puts Jesus above all? as Lord of all. Amen. All right, we're going to take a break. Uh, we'll be back after this short break with Don Chanel for some more. Thanks. If you'd like more information about today's guest on DC Radio, Don Chanel, simply email him at don at donchanelchanell.com. -E That's don at donchanel.com. Or you can visit his website at donchanel.com. That's don, C-H-A-N-N-E-L-L.com. Okay, we're back. This is Daryl Chesser here on DC Radio with our special guest today, Don Chanel. And I uh, really appreciate what you've had to say so far. Well, thanks, Daryl. Oh, by the way, you know, Don Chanel, DC. Ah, yes, Daryl Chesser, so Don this, I guess, so DC this is, Radio. See, this is DC Radio. Yeah. You know, this is double trouble. Nice. Or is it double for your trouble? I can't remember. Yeah, but something. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, either one of those works, I guess. Double your pleasure, double your fun. <laughs> Right? Okay, I can do it. Now. now, before the break, you had uh, been talking about, uh, we've been talking about the uh, 
preaching the gospel anywhere, same message, the true gospel. And uh, we dabbled on the, the um, tithing thing, you know, preaching it in a truer meaning of tithing. And hey, time, your time is tithed. I mean, because you trade dollars for your time on your job and other things. And some of that legal too. And <laughs> <laughs> But uh, uh, I wanted to branch off of that just real quickly on an aside. Uh, I remember growing up, uh, my parents, uh, it was a small church, so by necessity at some point, it was like we, from the time I was just a toddler up, I was in church, big mm -hmm. church. Yeah. And I didn't go to the, I didn't go to children's church. Didn't have it. Yeah, we didn't have it. And, you know, there is nursery, you know, because you, there's, those babies are so inconsiderate. <laughs> I mean, geez. How dare they? Yeah. But at least somebody was making noise during the service. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, uh, so as a result, an end result is, as I grew up and got around kids, you know, uh, teenagers and other things my age, I realized my knowledge of the scriptures and the things of God was just like way out there, past, you know, in that sense. And it's not because I'm some super, super spiritual or genius guy, but it was like the gospel was being preached. It wasn't being childish, you know, dumbed down for the kid. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not putting it down. I'm not in any way putting down children's church. I'm simply saying that holds true. The maxim, preach the gospel wherever you go. And to expose your young children, toddlers, to the gospel and big boy preaching, if, he's, if your church is preaching the true gospel, is a good thing. Yeah. And yeah, you may be I, like I was I, I I would be playing under the under the pew real quietly or this or that. But I was absorbed it was going in. It was going in. And I can't tell you as a preacher's kid uh, how many times I did get called down from the pulpit, <laughs> which is not pleasant. No. Not pleasant. And I knew I was going to get it when I got home. You know, because if you got called out in the church, it was like, okay, this isn't over yet. <laughs> yeah, this is just the beginning. But it was a revolutionary thing to me, and it's important to me because I don't want to dumb it down to anyone. And that means, well, my gospel doesn't need to be complicated, number one. Number two, it doesn't need to be dumbed down. It needs to be, here's, here's a simple thing. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, right? He lived a sinless life. He, did, he showed us the very face of God in everything that he did. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father, is what his own words were. Yep. He showed us God, and that was healing people, feeding people, restoring people, preaching the, the kingdom, as you say, and all of these things. Then he went to the cross. None of that was his. None of the iniquities, none of the sin, none of the sickness, disease, poverty, lack, or any of the other human things. None of it was his, but all of that was put upon him. He took it willingly for us. And he died. He wasn't murdered. He willingly went and gave up his life and his spirit. And then he was resurrected, put in the tomb. And three days later, God resurrected him, brought him back. And he uh, preached to the, the, his disciples for about 40 days, talked to them, met with them a few times, and uh, then went and is at the right hand of the Father. This is the gospel. This is the gospel that, that saves men's soul, that God's grace, his love, through Jesus Christ, if you'll simply believe him and ask him into your heart, he will supernaturally change you. Mm -hmm. Your life will be, as the epistles write it, I think it's uh, somewhere in the scriptures, but it says we've passed from death to life. We have gone from where we were dead in trespasses and sin to where we have an eternal life. We have a hope. We have a promise of being with our loved ones and all of those uh, uh, around, the, in other words, this life's not the end. That's the gospel. Now, that could be preached to anybody. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Tell exactly. me about Sozo. About Sozo. Yeah. God life. And that's uh, what is generally uh, in, the, in the Bible is talking about, what is it, when it says Sozo, or uh, what is the word they use for it in, in, in English? It is saved. Saved, right. Saved. And that becomes a very spiritual term uh, and, you know, just kind of fuzzy. <laughs> but its literal yeah. meaning is whatever you need saving from. Yeah. 
saved from fill in the blank. Yes. Yeah. And yes, that means, okay, God can help you in your finances. God can help you in your health. God can help you in your wisdom. God can help you in every, in your marriage, in your job, in every part of your life. And it's by faith in him. Yep. And once you demystify the words like Christ, that's a big spiritual word. But you go, it's just Messiah, which is, a, you know, another rendition of Messiah means anointed one. And in and, and Hebrew, and, and Christ is the Greek word for Messiah or anointing. Mm -hmm. So it's the anointing of God, or, or Acts 10, 38. Uh, is that right? Uh, yeah. How God anointed Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yep. How does it go? And raise him from the dead. And, and, and by the way, and to play off that, the, the thing about the anointing, you know, the Bible says it's the anointing that breaks, breaks the, the yoke. yoke. Yeah. So again, back to testing some kind of a test for our gospel. Um, you know, is, is what we're preaching yeah. causing yokes to be broken? Yokes to be broken. Burdens to be lifted. Yeah, yokes it is, is, is the, and, and, that's, and that's one of my, um, you know, I, I have been misunderstood uh, as being hard um, on sin or sinners, and I'm not. I'm very compassionate. I, I'm probably the opposite of some of the things I've been accused of, because my thing is yeah, the I'm sorry weight. About that. I the will, way, yeah, I will change my Yelp uh, rating. Will right you here. change that? I appreciate that. I appreciate that, there. But but I look I look at uh, my own life, and I look at other people, and I say, you know, sin is a burden. It is a weight. It is it is it weighs you down. <laughs> and uh, and it's not pleasant. Its effects are not pleasant on you. The wages of sin is death, and not just eternal, but it affects you in the, yeah. in this life as well. And preaching a gospel that allows people the opportunity to say, okay, if Christ is the anointed one, okay, that that also yeah, preaches yeah. good, sounds good. Anointed to what? Okay, well, if it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. And, and he's the anointed one, then if you accept him, there should be yokes being broken off your life. And that's not just the obvious things of alcoholism or drug addiction or something like that. But when the word says whom the son sets free, free is free indeed. indeed. It doesn't mean he's begun to uh, address some issues. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he's begun to recognize, you know, some some areas where he needs some self-improvement. I'm on my journey. I'm on my journey. Oh, don't get me started on that word. Uh, what I call onion peel theology. <laughs> you know, the, the thing about, you know, well, you know, he's just still working on me and I'm just, you know. Layer and by layer. Layer by changing, layer. Yeah, changing. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and by the way, I, I won't go down this rabbit trail. I'll just, I'll, I'll just look down the road and keep on going. But, you know, some of our horrible theology and, and doctrine in the Bible, uh, in the, uh, in the um, American church, uh, has been propagated by bad Christian songs. <laughs> it, I won't go down that road. Oh, they're I'm, good songs. I, I'm just bad theologically. Exactly. <laughs> but they sing good. They sing good. And they sell records. Uh, but uh, well, we don't do records anymore. They sell downloads. I'm sorry, i got to get my verbiage. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, you can tell I'm old school there. But, um, but the bottom line is, is... What we preach is what we present, setting people free. Because I, I hear a lot of messages out there that while they are encouraging, um, uh, you know, there's a scripture, I think it's in Jeremiah, where he's talking to the leaders of Israel, and the Lord is speaking prophetically, you know, through Jeremiah, and, and Jeremiah's talking to the leaders, and the Lord is saying to them, You have only you have only partially healed my people. You don't hear that one preached too much. Yeah. Okay, but a lot of what we preach in the American version of Christianity only partially heals people. It does point them to Christ. It does point them to Jesus. It does help them understand that he loves them no matter what. Yes. But if you just stop there, that no matter what I do, he loves me, then the inference is there's no need for transformation or salvation uh, that, that brings transformation, that, act, you know, that actualizes transformation in my life. <clears throat> but he loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son yep. so that whoever believes in him like, should not perish but have everlasting life. And so, um, and so, yes, he does. There's nothing I can do. One thing I've tried to, uh, you know, tell parents and I tried to do with my own kids is, you know, your kids, uh, if, if they, by the time they're five years old, they need to be so rooted and grounded in two things. Number one, 
Nothing you can ever do in your life can make me stop. If you turn into a mass murderer, it will not keep me. It will not keep me. Stop me from loving you. I may be a di- bit disappointed. Yeah, yeah, but. yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I may cut you out of the will. I still love you. But I still love you. I'm gonna love you no matter what because that's what the love of the Father oh, is. It, every every person who's ever died and and not gone to heaven, he still loved them just as much as he did anybody who made it to heaven. Yeah. So it, love is not really the end point of it is what that love does. What does love do? It sent his only begotten son so that he suffered and bled and died so that whatever it is that holds you in bondage, whatever that weight of sin is, whatever you've done, he still loves you. Let him not only forgive you. See, that this is a, I didn't really finish this while ago in the last segment, but it's not just about being forgiven of sin. It's about being free from sin. And that's, to me, that's a big, that, that's a major issue in the American doctrine and a, and a lot of things nowadays is, okay, yes, he will forgive me for my sins, but I also need him to free me from my sins. He didn't say who is forgiven is forgiven indeed. He said whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So yes, he forgave me of my sin, but he all, that same power I asked somebody one day that was kind of talking about that, and I said, well, let me ask you something. How is it that you can believe that there is a God that through the death of his son, the blood of Jesus, he has the ability to literally forgive you of your sins, but he doesn't have the power to free you from that sin? Okay, and let's just use a a, a real easy example of that. Let's say I'm a drug addict. I'm addicted I'm, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm past hope in the natural. 12 steps ain't working for me. I'm addicted. It is a bondage in my life. Okay, I can ask him to forgive me. Oh, God, please forgive me for, for getting to this place. However that happened, doesn't matter. Please forgive me. But I also need him to free me. The, the same power that wipes away my sins, that same power can transform my life and literally uh, free me from that bondage. Yeah. Whether it's an instant, you know, I've seen people instantaneously, miraculously, by the power of God, boom, never touched another drink, never picked up another needle, instantly delivered. And I've seen other people that it took them a few weeks or months yeah. to walk that thing out and to come out of it. So whether it's a miracle, you know, it, when it comes to healings and stuff, yeah. there's several different kinds of healings. It's still God's power. Yeah, it, but it's still One's His recovery. power. One is miraculous. Exactly. A miracle is instantaneous. Boom. Thank you and good night. And only God has the ability to know whether that person, you know, well, I, you know, I'm going to try to help Daryl here, but, I, you know, I, if yeah. I don't do this instantaneously, it probably ain't going to happen, so I'm going to give him a miracle. Yeah. Okay. Well, Don over here, you know, well, you know, he's a different case, uh, but he still needs freedom, yeah. you know. But there's some lessons that he needs to learn and walking this thing out that will cause him to grow spiritually so that he won't go back into that, yeah. so that he'll be free from it and never go back to it. So yours may be instantaneous. Mine might be over a period of weeks or months, but it's still the same power of God. Again, when you talk about, just let's talk about physical healings for a second. There were times that God, that Jesus, you will just look at Jesus. There's times he just goes, be healed, boom, done. You know, But then there's other times when the Bible talks about you know, is any sick among you? Let the elders lay hands on them, you know, the and the prayer of faith will save them, and they will recover. If yeah. you look at those two different words, miracles and recovery is two different things. Yeah. Miracles instantaneous. Recovery means they're gonna they're they this thing in a matter of hours or days or weeks, it's gonna be gone. Yeah. But it didn't happen in a moment's time. Okay. Yeah. Well, same thing with the other things that we're talking about, addictions or whatever. But still, it's the power of God that not only forgives me of my sins, but it frees yeah. me from them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the ways I tend to look at it is, as a believer, that's awesome. As a believer, we have, uh, uh, by his stripes, we were healed. And we are healed. In the, New, in the Old Testament prophets, it said, prophesied that in the, mm-hmm. in the yep. present tense. And in the New Testament, Peter brings it even further in the past tense. By his stripes we were healed. We have access to this by faith, by believing that when we prayed, this thing's done. 
and it may be this recovery. I keep repeating it. I keep confessing it. I know God's already, he's heard my prayer and by his stripes that the Lord has given me this healing is mine. It's part of the benefit package. Now, the miracles are another step up. That's outside of that. That's outside the church and inside the church. The miracles have no boundary. And, and I dare say what happened in that uh, Walmart comes into that category mm -hmm. where instantaneously that guy is what should have taken, could have taken months or years to go through the therapy and whatever to get his leg healed. He's done. Yep, exactly. I don't know if he's a Christian. Doesn't matter. Didn't matter. Mm -mm. God never hurt Jesus Christ when he was on this earth, never healed one Christian. Thank you again. <laughs> night. Well, well, let's see law. Think about that for a second. Here, here's, here's my thing is um, a, a lot of times if you go back and look at, um, at the ministry of Jesus and these people that, uh, okay, some people might argue, some theologians might argue and say, well, they were Israel, so they were God's people. Okay, not but, all of them, but, but, but most not, majority. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, as a society, basically, they were serving Jehovah. But, but obviously, there was there was some differences there because some of them went, "Ooh, hey, Messiah, I'm in," and others went, "I ain't buying into this for nothing." Okay, well, um, when the Jesus healed, was that the ones who believed it? Yeah, and Jesus went and healed. At times, it, there's one place it says where he healed them all. Now, I don't know if that was dozens, hundreds, or thousands, but however big that group was that day, he healed all of them. Now, that's a, that's a great church service right there oh, when yeah. everybody walks out completely healed. Okay, but then there was other times he went to one city and he says he could not do many great miracles because of their... Except yeah. heal a few sick folk. That yeah. was... He, except <laughs> he, you're going like, that is revival in any church in America. Yeah. <laughs> And it looks like a bad day for yeah. him. <laughs> and that was a bad day for him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's like, oh my gosh, what that? You know, I got to go back and talk to dad about yeah. this. <laughs> and what's, but I mean, the scripture immediately following that says, and he began to teach in their synagogues. Yeah. So, and there was, he, he went back to teach the gospel and about God. You know, let's get back into their hearts and minds what God wants to do. Yep. Um, but it is, uh, it's an awesome thing. Nobody... We struggle to come up with answers why some people seem to be healed and some aren't. Mm -hmm. And if you get into that business, it's just you're, you're going down a dead-end street. I yeah. don't know. I know. I fully believe a, a healing is available for every man, woman, boy, and child. That's know. the heart of God. I mean, we even hear, uh, going back into the Old Testament, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, this entire community, some estimate as high as three million or more, yep that every man, woman, boy, and child says there's not one feeble one among them. Yeah, that's amazing. That is stunning. Imagine uh, God says, America, you're healed. And every one of us. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think one of the keys to that was, remember the Passover. The, the thing partaking was... Partaking of the body and the blood of the lamb. It was partaking of the body and the blood of the lamb. Yeah. They all partook of what was the, the first big corporate... First, they went from death to life because if the blood hadn't been on the door, right. they're dead people. There you right? go. Or, well, at least a yeah. good portion of them. But because the blood was on the door, not their condition at that point. In other words, I don't care who's in that house. Yeah. If the blood's on, blood's the, door, on the door, you're good. The death passes over. Now, right. eat, the, eat the body of that eat lamb. Eat the lamb. Right? Eat, eat the, the lamb. The strength, the healing, the provision came. They walked out wealthy and healthy and whole. Yeah. And that's when, you know, when the word talks about, you know, because you don't rightly discern the body of Christ, many are sick among you and some even die early. Yeah, 1 okay. Corinthians 10. It's so, it's, so it's like, okay, well, uh, again, I agree with you. If you start going down that road, when people, and that's a common question I've heard my entire life and ministry, is why do some people get healed and others I don't? don't? But yeah. I do know this. If we go back to the word, yeah. if we go back to the word, and we partake of the blood, and we partake of the body, and we do rightly discern. Back to that American theology. What is in me, what, what is in my theology or my doctrine that causes me to not be able to rightly discern the body of Christ? Yeah. So I'm not going to blame anybody or, or, uh, or, or, or put them down or judge them as to whether or not they got healed or not. Yes. Okay. I'm just going to take personal responsibility and say, I just want to make sure 
that whatever it is that I believe, yeah. that whatever it I, I believe, you know, Paul talked about, he said, the word of, he uses phrase, the word of God, which is able to save your soul. Okay, I'm going to go back to the word of God and say, okay, Lord, what is it? What is it in me? In my mind, you it, repent. Remember the message for John, Jesus, the disciples, and what he told us to preach. Repent for the kingdom. It's not just the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven. In the Old Testament, that was a you know word picture of the in the Hebrew of turning to God and turning away from sin. But the Greek word for repent literally means, in its simplest form, to change your mind. Yeah. So Jesus Man, says, no, yeah. change, change, your yeah. change your thinking. Because the kingdom of God's right here in front of you. Yeah. Well, what is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I don't hear sickness and disease in there, okay? I don't hear addictions. I don't hear bondages. I don't hear generational curses or strongholds. I hear I hear freedom, yeah. okay, in that. So if, if the Word of God is able to save my soul, and, and I go to it, and I, and I renew my mind, as Paul said, don't be conformed to the world, Romans but be 12. transformed yeah. by the renewing of your mind. mind. How do I renew my mind from any thoughts that are contrary yeah. to, the, to, the, to, to the true gospel yeah. that sets men free? And that's part of the warfare. It, it, First Corinthians. Yes, sir. says everything that exalts itself against the knowledge. Right. Back to that metanoia or the mind. The heart, the spirit, anything that is telling you God can't or God won't mm -hmm. in the gospel and through faith in Jesus Christ, anything that's telling you that is exalting itself against the knowledge of God in you. Right. Your heart literally is condemning you. Yeah. And God, Jesus, made a big point. God's mm -hmm. not condemning you. Paul made a big point. He says, dude, there is therefore now no, no condemnation. condemnation to them that are in God Christ God is Jesus. not only able, he's willing. And yes. he wants to. It was his idea. Yep. So what thoughts are in my mind? Yeah. What thoughts are in my mind? One of my little, one of my little mantras that I, you know, preach about renewing the mind um, is I always talk about when it talks about casting down vain imaginations and every thought. Okay, uh, there's three kinds of nations. You know, there's the nations of the world. <laughs> I, I see what you did there. Yeah. Imagine nations. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then there's and then there's denominations. You know, nations and denominations all divide us up into categories. But listen to this: image nations, image nations. There is a there is a nation of images that are inhabiting your mind. Let's let's just relate it to illegal aliens here, okay? Um, not to get political, Un but just as undocumented. a... Undocumented. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> undocumented. Yeah, yeah. Like I, like I said, illegal aliens. But um, when, the, when, when there's something that is illegal, it's not a part. I have the mind of Christ, the Word says. So if there's a thought in there that it's exalting itself above the knowledge of, of God, then it's illegal. It's not, it's, un, it's, it's not supposed to be living in there. So I have to go in there by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the word of God, and renew my mind. Washing and of the water of the washing word. Washing of the water of the word. Exactly right. And, and, and Does that relate to the feet washing in a sense? He goes, you're all clean by the word. You know, I've cleaned you by the words I've spoken. Mm -hmm. your, your whole body doesn't need it now that you're born again, but your feet, by walking through the world, it gets dirty. Mm -hmm. He says, you begin to understand this thing that, listen, if you're not washing yourself with the gospel and renewing yourself, from time to time, if not every day, yeah. and washing yourself with not the Ten Commandments, but the Gospel. The yeah. Ten Commandments are fine. Understand, I'm not coming down. But it's not the Ten Commandments that saves people. Yeah. It's the Gospel about right. Jesus Christ that saves people. You wash yourself with this continually, and it, your mind begins to be renewed. Yep, exactly. And listen at that word, renew. That means it was new, but something got off, so it has to be re nude okay so same way that we go in and we take a shower and we're clean yeah. and everything smelling good and looking good yeah. and then after a period of time um it's not yeah. anymore you know the, the hair gets oily and the body gets dirty and stinky and you got to go back and shower again yeah and so you have to really our showers are re-showers. We have to re-shower, yeah. you know. We re-eat, we re-shower, we re-eat, we re-sleep. Re That's exactly right. <laughs> and so when I renew my mind, I go in and anything that's crossed the border into my mind that's an illegal thought. 
that's trying to exalt itself above the knowledge of God, I have to go in there and call that thing out and say, no, I repent. I change my, my thinking. I change my mind. And I go, no, that's wrong thinking. I'm not going to believe that. This is what the Word says. And whether it's the world system or whether it's a religious system, either one, yeah. that has put that thought there, I reject it and I deport that thought back outside of my thinking. Thoughts and images are always going to come. Yes. Whether by you or the enemy whispering in your ear, media, entertainment, friends, things you see. Always going to come. You're never going to stop that. Mm -hmm. um, tell me if that relates to James, where I believe it's in one or two James. But he, uh, uh, he begins to say about the uh, uh, temptation. When temptation comes, then it's like, it, and it drops in your heart, <laughs> then it's not long till the physical manifestation or the sin follows, the action follows. Yeah. And he was really telling you exactly how we work. Because it's like Jesus addressed it in the Gospels when he was preaching about, you know, even if you thought, you looked at a woman, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. He's not suggesting you gouge your eyes out. He was bringing the law back to its pristine standard and said, if you're going to go by the law, yes, you should. But he was, we were basically seeing this when temptation comes. You know, when the whisper comes, if you sit there and think about it long enough and you don't do something about it, re-change re your mind, rethink, that's going to start to take root, drop in, and, and a harvest. It's like a seed. It's the exact way the gospel works. It's why we renew ourselves because when I put that new thought in mm -hmm. and wash myself with what Christ said, this is what open your mouth. I, I heard Kenneth Copeland say this once. He goes... You know, try to count to 10, and while you're counting to 10 in your head, now say, open your mouth and say something, start talking. And everybody did it. He goes, now your counting stopped, didn't it? <laughs> and he's saying, your thoughts can't continue it if you'll interrupt it with your mouth and declare the word. What That's does good. Jesus say about this? And begin to wash yourself with the truth. Yeah. Those thoughts aren't the truth. The word of God is the truth. Yes. So, so we begin to see ourselves. It's not long until we see John 1 take place into what James said. When temptation comes, it gets into your heart. Then it's not long before manifestation. It's the same thing that happened. It said Mary said yes to what the angel said. <laughs> and then it wasn't long before John 1, John, uh, 1 John 1, 14 says, And the word became flesh. And dwelt among and us. Dwelt among exactly us. how Jesus Christ came to this earth. It was the renewing of Mary's mind. How this? How can this be? By the power of the Holy Ghost, the angel said. She goes, so be it. Yeah. And boom, conception. And it was the process of time. In nine months, it was in her heart. And it began to grow. And it manifested in as Jesus Christ. Yeah. And you know Mary. You know. You know. You know, I don't care what any theologian would try to argue, say, well, it's not written that way, so we don't know it. Listen, you don't have to be a rocket science and scientist in theology to figure out that when this angel appears to this girl that most scholars will say was somewhere 14, 15 years old, you know, which was childbearing years back in the day. You know, it's only been the last hundred years, we, you know, and uh, out of the clear blue sky. And here is... This girl with this angel standing there going, uh, you're going to be Messiah's mommy. You know there was a million thoughts going through her head. Like, what the? Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, so, well, how? Which, well, I mean, why? Me? I mean, there's 101 reasons that she had to go, okay, I, I ate something really bad last night before I went. I'm, I'm having, you know. But the bottom line was, like what you were talking about, her mouth stopped those thoughts that were going through her head. And she said, you know, in essence, I got 101 reasons to believe this is crazy. But nevertheless, power of life and death in the tongue, nevertheless, be it unto me according to your word. So she put it back on God. Yeah, put it back on God. She exactly. Said, on okay, his word. I accept If that, it's his word, you do it. Yeah, there you go. And so when the Bible says that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, what are what are, you know? The two scriptures that automatically join up with those is uh, that tells me number one, 
whatever thoughts are in my mind get down into my heart. Yeah. Okay. If you that's, if you lead them there long enough. That's why Jesus yeah. was talking about. Okay. It's not just the physical act of adultery. It's you thought about it. I had a guy try to tell me one time that was you know, that was uh, you know his wife had caught him in adultery. And, um, and you know, it was like, you know, the, I don't know how this happened. It just, it was an accident. I didn't. Started and, a long time before it, that. Yeah, and it's like, it's like, bud, listen, man, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to beat you over the head. But you got to understand, you thought about this. There's that thought. Yeah, I did. It got into your heart, mm-hmm. and the lust said, yep, I'm going to do it. And yeah. then you acted on it. It's a three-part thing. Thought, heart, actions. Yeah. Okay, well... Here's two scriptures that go along with that. To me, immediately when you talk about as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeah. But here's, a, here's to me, the, the, the better one is guard your heart with all diligence for all out of it is, flow the issues of life. In other words, yeah. and, you know, if you take that literally, uh, you know, we put it in modern verbiage, contemporary vernacular would be Guard your heart with, with, with everything in you yeah. because whatever's in your heart is what you're going to live out. Yeah. You know. Well, that's what Jesus followed up with on that uh, uh, what's ever in the heart. You know, mm-hmm. was he said, it's not what goes in the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, what you out. drink or you eat. Mm-hmm. He says that God has taken care of that business. You can trust him. The digestive system, everything's going to take care of that. That's just dumb. That's not what makes you unclean. He goes, it's what goes or comes out of the mouth is from the heart mm-hmm. it's what comes out and he goes and he lists it adulteries and fornications when you begin to speak these things and and it begins to take root you know the power of this that that goes to james again mm-hmm. talking about the tongue tongue little bitty thing you start a big old fire it can ruin your world and the same thing can change your world. yeah yeah exactly and well, i'm not we're not talking positive confessions right we're talking speaking the word of god and fighting resisting the devil Mm -hmm. resisting the devil is saying no no that's not my thought stop it i i have the mind of christ i rely on his thoughts and what he does i rely on that in my life and so no i reject you yep the power of no is pretty big and it goes and it goes back to the basics of the basics of just being born again of being saved how what's the two things if you believe in your Heart and speak and confess with your mouth. It, it, it's it's the same thing that got you into the kingdom. Yeah, and that's Romans chapter ten. If you're following along, yes, exactly. Those are needful scriptures. Yeah, and um, Daryl's a lot better at uh, scripture references. I I I, I fell back on uh, Jesus and the devil. In, in the wilderness during the 40 days, yeah. you know, and it, it is written, you know, I, I can I can, I can, can tell you if it's written, but I might not be able to tell you. What, you know, used to tell you which Old Testament or yeah. New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> when the living word of God uses the written word of God. There you go. To fight the enemy. Yeah. I'm thinking that's a clue. Here's that's a clue. Here's the sign. <laughs> yeah, here's your sign. Here's your sign. Yeah, tra- <laughs> trademark. <laughs> Yeah, you should have trademarked that a long time ago. Bill Ingvall would have made you a multi-millionaire. All right, we're going to take one last break, and uh, we'll be back on the other side of the break with Don Chanel. If you'd like more information about today's guest on DC Radio, Don Chanel, simply email him at don at donchanel, C-H-A-N-N-E-L-L dot com. That's don at donchanel dot com. Or you can visit his website at donchanel dot com. That's don, C-H-A-N-N-E-L-L dot com. back with a special guest tonight, Don Chanel from the mountains of North Carolina, who has come down to Charlotte to spend a little time with his family. And we were able to snag him here for a little bit. And uh, we've been talking about all kinds of things tonight, but during the break, 
we, uh, we got to talking about grace a little bit, and uh, we got there in a roundabout way. We were talking about a friend of ours whose name shall not be mentioned, but we're going to mention it. <laughs> and, um, Just because. But uh, it was Gene Scott. Yeah. Tell us about what happened when you listened to him teach. Well, you know, uh, Daryl, that's probably a name that not a lot of people, uh, I guess, under the age of 50 maybe, or yeah. something would maybe even recognize. But The um, younger ones recognize his wife. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's true. But, um, but anyway, yeah, he's out of, uh, was out of his when he was alive. Yeah, he's uh, out of L.A., but uh, yeah, he was a uh, Pentecostal preacher in a major, uh, you know, Pentecostal denomination and had some problems with the denomination and left it and... And uh, he just kind of um, was, a, was a major theologian. I mean, just a, 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 what I would consider a theological just genius. But um, but anyway, um, yeah, he was uh, he was ostracized by the by the Pentecostal religious community because of some of the things that he did. That Pentecostals back in those days, and we're talking the '70s and '80s and even the '90s, just didn't do. But uh, I would I would. Uh, get to see him every once in a while. Back in the days, it's something else you got to be at least 50 years old yeah. to remember the 10-foot satellite dishes in your backyard. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. People think it's horrible to have an 18-inch dish to get direct TV or or, uh, or dish, but man, I mean, back in the day, it was a 10-foot dish expensive. in your backyard for you to be able to get <laughs> satellite TV, but you got a bunch of stuff that, you know, you didn't get off your regular... Yeah, uh, antenna or even early days of cable, but yeah, I would uh, watch him sometime in places that uh, had him and his network on 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 uh, on the dish, and uh, would listen to him. And um, he was just really a. Um, but one of my favorite things to listen to him teach was on grace, because when he would really go into the really break down, he really was a was a a master of the of the Greek language. And understanding how to how to correctly translate and interpret and you know bring it into the English understanding and when he would sit down and break down Paul's writings, um, it was it was just mind boggling. Not only just the not, but it wasn't just the knowledge of it and the detail that he had, but the spirit in which he in which he taught that and revealed the true grace of God. And I can remember sitting and just listening to him teach on grace and just literally sitting there and just, even though I've been raised in church, you know, you and I both been raised, we've heard grace all of our life. That it's, a, it's a nice little spiritual term. Yeah. yeah. But man, when, when he really opened up the scriptures and what Paul was, was teaching us, um, I mean, I would just sit there and literally just weep, just, just sit there in my chair and just listen to this guy teach and just weep at the revelation and the understanding of, of God and that, that he could be that loving and that gracious, you know, to us and helping us understand grace. And I think it's probably one of the areas where most most theological and doctrinal things that are out there right now, there's a lot of there's a lot of just absence of it. It's just not taught. And then there's a lot of stuff that's taught that's just that's the wrong thing. Like uh, Jude t- uh, talks about. Uh, right before Hebrews, I mean, uh, right before Revelation. And he's saying, I guess the proper Greek thing is uh, many who are preaching have transposed or substituted. Mm -hmm. Uh, They didn't pervert grace. They put a whole new thing (laughs) and and called it grace. Right, exactly. And, uh, And so it is when you hear the term Peter, Uh, Or is it Paul? No, Paul, when he uh, asked for the thorn in the flesh to be removed three times. God's answer was, my grace is sufficient. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. That means, you know, he'll help me get through it. You go, dude, it is so much more massive than you can even imagine. Yeah, it's not just, um, don't worry, you'll have the help you need to endure it. Oh, man, it goes so much deeper than that. And just the the understanding that grace is, um, you know, just number one, that it's available. Yeah. That's a huge thing. It, it, to really understand the depth of grace that is available to us uh, when we're in Christ and He's in us. But then the application mm-hmm. of it, how it applies on my daily walk, especially in terms of um, 
the, the difference in a lot of things nowadays that are um, things that are touted, and I might have to agree with you on the Jew thing, that are even have just been substituted for grace, where you really have to um, to look at it and go, okay, what what does grace um, not just where the born again experience or salvation or eternity and that kind of thing, the generality of that, but specifically how today when it says sufficient to the day that today there's grace for me today you know we talk about a lot of times the steadfast love of the lord never ceases his mercies never come to an end but they're new every morning okay mercy is new every morning grace is sufficient today yesterday's grace was wonderful it was for yesterday i've got some in the bank for tomorrow okay but today living out my life what does that grace look like and act like? And, and, and uh, how is it lived out on a day-to-day -day basis in my life with just the day-to-day -day getting up, take my shower, go out and do what I'm supposed to do and live my life? Um, how does that work? And I think that's one of the great concerns that I have for the American church and um, you know, what I like to call the American version of Christianity, the American gospel. Um, is concerned is I think we have come to a point where grace has been so, um, you know, for lack of a better term, watered down, if not substituted, that we, a, a lot of people today, if you were to ask them, talk to me about grace, they basically would, in, in, in very simple terms, would basically say, well, you know, here's, here's the bottom line. If I, you know, uh, God loves me. And, and there's grace for me. And so, um, you know, when I sin or when I fall short or when I, um, when I need that grace, you know, God, God's there for me. And so um, it's, it's sort of like the way the love of the Lord is taught, you know, the love of God. Yeah, God does love me no matter what, but that love has a purpose and an end that he sent Jesus to die for me so that that love can be expressed through me being born again, not only forgiven of sin, but freed from sin. Grace very much is like that. Yes, there is grace for us. God, God does extend grace to us no matter how we fall, how many times we fall. Uh, as long as we're human, there's, we're not going to, you know, perfection in this, in this fleshly body you know, it, it, now, Utopianism. yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Now I do believe that we need to raise the bar way back up to oh, what yeah. to what we are able to live above sin, but but a lot of people are looking at grace as permission to sin. Well, I can do that. You know. Well, I, okay. Well, you know, the world's grace for that. First of all, you don't need permission. You're going to do what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When we let's no. let's say it another way. When we decide to sin. Yeah. Um, you know, that God understands, and so there's grace for that, which being interpreted, you know, that book that somebody needs to write, which being interpreted meaneth, you know, and fill in all those blanks, which being interpreted meaning uh, means that, uh, yep, uh, God knew I was going to sin, so he gave me grace, and so it's okay, everything's fine. Um, but yet when you balance things out with all of Scripture, you know, Ezekiel had to eat the whole scroll. It was sweet to his mouth, but it was bitter to his stomach. There's some stuff that we love to eat that's the sweet part of the word. Some of the stuff that's bitter to us, but it's good for us, you know, that his grace is sufficient to this day. That means, number one, I am going to live in a grace, the grace that empowers me to live above sin. If in my fleshly body uh, I do sin, and we mentioned this when we were talking a while ago during the break. The scripture doesn't say when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. It says if yeah. we sin. And if you read that in context, Paul is literally teaching the church how to not sin, how to live above sin. But understanding that in our humanity, it's, it's not the expected. You know, I've heard preachers, you've probably heard this too, all of my life get up saying, oh, bless God, we're going to sin every day. Okay, well, you know, at some point you get, you have to go to those scriptures where if we continue in sin, yeah. we're not in him. Uh, so it's not permit, grace is not permission to sin. It's power to live above sin. And if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father where his grace restores us if we, if we do. 
But the bigger implication there is that that same power that we talked about in one of the earlier segments, that same power that forgave me of sins, there's grace there to free me from sin and for me to live free from it, to not have to obey my body and my will in its lust, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. I don't have to give in to that. There's grace to live for Him and in Him above sin. On the rare, the rare, the exception to the rule, not the rule, on the exception to the rule that I do fall, yeah. that I do um, sin, there is grace to be forgiven and to reestablish me in living above it. And I think that's where the bar for me, if I can say it that way, the bar of grace has been laid so low that you, all you have to do is trip over it to, you know, to get it. You know, and we need to raise that bar back up, not in legalism, not in condemnation, not in that, but to say, look, guys, we have the ability. That's the true testimony. Yeah. It's not that I get out there and sin a bunch every day, but there's grace for it. The I testimony... Think, I think Peter said, I, I believe it was Peter, add to your faith mm -hmm. virtue mm -hmm. and this and this and character and patience. And, and you yes. know, in other words, you're adding to... By the grace of God, mm -hmm. he's allowing you, knowing he's answering your prayer, but you need to be patient. He's answering your prayer, but now you need to add virtue to this and be, you know, and watch how you look at other people and judge other people. Give them that same uh, a, a, a ability to change with time, you know, and, and it's like these things you add to, as you say, I'm not staying here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not just taking the grace. I'm adding to by the power of God, he's fruit of the Spirit, right? Right. And it's, well, it's like a child. I mean, when you, in your, in your faith walk, in learning to walk, you know, that's one of the terminologies, one of the, the things that helps us understand that our, 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 our we'll journey learn, in him. Learn not how to poop your pants. Right. Yeah. Then it, learn how to walk without falling a lot. Thank you. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when, I, you know, how many times did any normal child fall when they were learning how to walk? A bunch. According to my mom, I still do. <laughs> she just laughs. She's going, you know, when you were growing up, you would just be standing there and you'd fall. And I'm going, why didn't you ever tell me this? She goes, I don't know. It never came up. I said, you've been laughing at me my whole life. She goes, oh, yeah, 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 pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So, and, and but the more that you practice, you know, the more that you walk, the more your balance, the more, you know, of your, your cognitive you know, awareness of where you are and, ooh, there's something there that I need to step over. There's something there that I need to step up to or down to or whatever. And you learn how to walk without falling. Now, every once in a while, are you, you know, are you you're reading your iPhone and you, you there's, a, there's a hump in the sidewalk you didn't see and you trip and fall? Yeah, but it's not the rule. It was when you were a babe when you first started. If you watch two, YouTube, it is the rule. It is. There are so many people. <laughs> Walk out into traffic. Yeah, in just bones. failed videos. I love it, but yeah, but you know, you know. <clears throat> so the point is, I know that may be an oversimplification of it, but the the point is, the more we walk, the better we get at it. Yeah, and it, and and um, it just becomes second nature. Well, I, to me, the sin nature is what we were delivered from. Is what we were saved from. Is what we were raised to life in Christ from. Was from the sin nature. Okay, so as we were learning to walk, did we screw up a lot? Yeah. Did we fall a lot? Yeah. Did were we making mistakes while we were learning how not to do this? And you know, you know, yes. So at some point, if you look at somebody that's thirty years old, forty years old, fifty years old, and they're still walking like a baby and falling over and stumbling and everything, you're gonna look at them and go, okay, either something's abnormal about that person. Why didn't they learn? At I mean, let's face it. A, a, a two-year-old yeah. and a five-year-old. There's a major difference in how those two, those two walk. There's a lot of difference, big difference between the two-year-old and the five-year-old, the way they walk, because they learn something even just in that little three-year period between two and five. But look at a five-year-old versus a sixteen-year-old kid that's running down, you know, a court with a basketball and able to dribble while he's running and, you know, put the ball under his leg and behind his back and go up and do a two-hand slam behind his head, you know, there's a, there's a sense of balance, no pun intended, there's a sense of balance that comes with maturity that causes you not just to walk, but even to be able to run effectively. 
do you still occasionally, exception to the rule, stumble? Yes. And so when it comes to grace, I guess my, my go-to thing with grace is grace is there for you when you sin as a young believer. But as you grow in grace and knowledge, isn't that what we're supposed to do? To continue to grow in grace and knowledge, the Word says, then we learn how not to trip, how not to fall. And so grace at first may have to forgive us a lot, you know, because we, we there's there's that thing. We're this is a whole new life I'm living in. I'm having to figure out this whole faith and grace and living in Him and Him living in me and all this kind of stuff. I'm having to renew my mind in the Word. But as you mature, you reach a place to where grace now is not having is not just keeping is not catching you when you fall. It's now the strength and the power of God to keep you from falling. And 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 we're that. That's the part of grace that we're that we've almost stopped teaching in the American church. Keep striving towards the goal. Yeah, exactly. Get up. Yeah. Run your race. Keep going. By faith, through grace, or is it through by faith by grace through faith? I think it's by faith through grace. Yeah. Grace is the mechanism of God's love. It is the application of it. It is the the delivery of it. Mm -hmm. I personally tend to believe it's not an it. It is a he. I believe it is Jesus Christ. I believe he is the grace of God demonstrated on earth. Yes. And uh, that it was God's grace that sent him here. Amen. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with that. Well, to me, there's so much of, of what we talk about, um, that just a little side issue just to make a point. Um, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are, there, there's, a certain, there's a certain sect of Christianity in America uh, that you know that that really goes back and embraces the, the Hebrew roots and the Jewish thing and all that stuff and I and I love to study the types of awesome. shadows. I yeah. know where you came from. Yes, where the church came I, I don't. From. I don't think you can awesome. really understand yeah. the New Testament until you understand the I Old Testament. Yeah. And so people, a lot of times, in their zeal, uh, are, try to go back and pick up a lot of things Move and back towards Judaism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're celebrating the feast and everything. And listen, hey, I don't mind at Passover. Okay. I don't mind sitting down at Passover and having a Seder meal. I think it's a beautiful thing to remember yeah. that type and shadow to know what Christ yeah. fulfilled. We cut up a big ham. I get Paul it. says, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. And 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 but Paul says he he calls Jesus. He says, or is it in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, which I personally believe Most this was. Most of us yeah, believe Paul yeah. did right. So, but the writer of Hebrews says Jesus, who is not represents Jesus, who is our Passover. Yeah. So I believe I make that point just to say that he fulfilled all the law. So to me, when I agree with you, when you say grace, love, love is not something that God has. It is who He, he is. He is love. In grace, this we know and believe that God is love. First, God. yes. Yes, and grace to me, it's part of His nature. It's not just something in His tool belt yeah. that He uses, that Holy Spirit uses to help us. It's Jesus. It's, it is Him. Every to me, everything that radically changed my theology and doctrine years ago, when I began to realize that Jesus really did fulfill. And the way, just that this is just the way He said it to me. He has to be real simple with me. Um, when it comes to fulfill all the law. Think of it this way, fulfilled, filled full. So what we have today in grace is the law filled yeah. full of Jesus. Yeah, the and righteous that, requirements of the law were fully satisfied in Christ and fully. nailed to the cross. Yes, and amen. And the written, of the, the, the written uh, warrant or whatever it's called of, was nailed to the cross. Right, exactly, yeah. So you know, uh, you know, I, I know there's a lot of discussions today on grace. You know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the critics of, um, of, um, of uh, seeker friendly movements and different things like that. You know, call it greasy grace and things like that or whatever. To me, the the, the basics of grace are real simple. They're, they're just real simple. Um, he loved me enough to send his son, and when Jesus filled the law full of himself, everything in the law became Jesus. 
He's my Passover. He's my Tabernacles. He's my Pentecost. He's all the feasts. He's everything. He's my Sabbath. Yes. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with setting aside one day a week for everybody to get together and have a, a service and, and celebrate Jesus and, and and learn from each other and love on each other and have and have corporate fellowship and worship. And that's, I think that's great. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's not a it, it's not a day anymore. It's a person. He is. Come unto me, all ye that labor. And in a heavy laden, and I will give you the rest. He is my rest. He is my Sabbath. He's everything that that type and shadow was. It's about Jesus, including grace. So when I say that I need his grace, I'm saying I need him. When I say that grace uh, doesn't just forgive me for my sins, but it frees me from my sins, and it keeps me from my... There's a third one. He forgives me. He frees me from my sins, but he keeps me from sin, that he's able to keep me in him. Is Jesus sinless? Yes. Then as long as I stay in him and him in me, I can live above sin. Am I still in a human body? Do I still make dumb decisions? Yes. But it's not the rule of thumb to live that way. My rule of thumb is I get up every day and there's grace for me to live Mm -hmm. forgiven, freed from, and kept from sin. When that happens, that if that the Bible talks about, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. But please go read all those verses before and after that that are talking about how grace keeps us. What a what an incredible! I mean, which one of these thoughts is greater? Which one of these? Which one of these deals? Okay, you know, you go back to door number one, door number two, whatever you know. Which one of these? Let's make a deal. Which one of these deals is really better? That I can go out and and just stumble my way, send my way through life, and that His grace is there to go. Well, I understand. You know, you're just human. You know, and Adam screwed up a long time ago, and so you're human, and so I'm here for you. Or, or is it a greater, a higher thing to say, I wake up tomorrow morning, and His mercies are new. They're brand new. His love is consistent. It's there. It's Him. His grace is here today from my waking conscious moment till I lay down and go to bed. It's there to keep me in Him and to keep me from sin. Which one of those sounds like a better deal to you? I'm, I'm you know. Like, huh. you know do, 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 do. Door number three? I, yeah, door number three. I mean, you know, but, you know. So that's kind of where I'm at on the grace thing. So one of the most haunting tunes... In, I can't say the world, I can only speak for American culture. <laughs> but one of the most haunting tombs in, in American culture, you see it in secular media, you see it thrown around, you see it made fun of sometimes, but it is it's played at funerals, it's piped during scenes of carnage in a certain situations in media and stuff like this. But it's a song that was penned that talks about the amazing grace of God. <laughs> and it is so haunting. When you hear the bagpipes, boom. I mean, and I don't care how secular, not saved you are, that thing emotes. It does. It emotes something in them. I mean, drunks will sing it. <laughs> I mean, right. almost anybody can sing it. You start the tune and people... Amazing grace, how sweet and everybody's in, in their <laughs> end. and and you're going. There's something about that. There's something that evokes Jesus, the word grace, and God's love, grace, and it's there. This it's almost back to you know First Corinthians and to Romans one and two, where it says the entire world around you, you know there's a God, you know there's something out there, you know there's something. There's signs everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, and God wants, it's his will, according to what I read in the scriptures, it is his will and desire that all men come to a knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. by faith. That is his will. And what but some of the bitter stuff that we have to eat, as you said in the scroll, is when you finally come to the realization that not even Jesus, when he walked on this earth and showed them the very face of God, there were... There were so many that just walked away. And, and once you've come through that veil and you're on this side looking out, you're going, how can you pass this up? Yeah. Dude, yeah. 
How can you pass this up? I was dead. I'm alive now. How? I want you to have this. I'm not condemning you. I'm saying, come on in. The water's good. Yeah. And that is one of the bitter pills to me is to realize, you know what? If we had more money, we could get more people saved. If we worked harder, we could get more people saved. Well, maybe. But the bottom line is, this is the hard, bitter pill. Some people simply do not want it. Yeah. Yeah. God never gives up on them. I believe to their very deathbed, their last seconds, their life plays in front of them and everything they've ever heard, every preacher they went across about the gospel and the grace, it's flashing. Can't, now, take it now, take it now. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And I, I was thinking about an, uh, an uncle that I had um, years ago. I, I was, uh, my mother and dad adopted me when I was three this days old. This wasn't Verdon. Yeah, no, this wasn't, this wasn't Verdo. Um, there was an uncle that I had that, um, well, let me tell you this one. My, my mother was the next to youngest of like 11 children, okay, in this family. Ooh, you guys weren't and, Catholic. And so, <laughs> no. Uh, but um, her and my dad were in their um, were so, in their 40s. He's a beautiful man. Yeah, that, look at this guy out here looking nice. at us, just watching us talk. Um, we're looking at Don's son-in-law. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's a not, beautiful not, man. Not, not a pretty sight, but anyway. <laughs> um <clears throat> and uh, so my mom and dad were in their 40s when they adopted me. So as a child, all of my aunts and uncles were ancient, you know, because they were all older than her, you know. So I remember all my aunts and uncles were like great aunts and uncles, you know. I actually kind of yeah. grew up with my first cousins. They were My first cousins were mm -hmm. my age and yeah. even some of my second cousins. And, um, and so this uncle that I had, um, his, his, uh, his wife was my mother's sister. And he never would serve the Lord. Never would serve the Lord. And um, and anyway, on his deathbed, and in, in his, I think he was in his late seventies, on his deathbed, um, I think it was the day before he passed. Um, you know, one of his daughters, uh, if I remember correctly, you know, talked to him about the Lord again, and just big tears running down his eyes, and he said, "Yes, I want to be saved." And you know there are there are a lot of religious people that would say you know oh, I just don't believe you can turn God down for all them years and all of a sudden just jump in right before you cross Jordan you know I'm sorry it's not his will the, the prophet said God said in the prophets I was reading in Ezekiel the other day I don't take pleasure in the death of the wicked yeah. it's his it's his will that all should yeah. come to repentance yeah. all of them all come to repentance and it's not a matter of how I mean I was. I remember my born again experience when I was six years old. I remember it like it was yesterday, Daryl. I remember the Holy Spirit convicting me, <clears throat> excuse me, of my sin and my, my my state of separation from God. And I remember going down to that altar as a six year old kid and 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 asking God to forgive me of my sins and, yeah. and, to, and to come live in me. And I, I can, I'm serious. I can remember it like I'm 60 years old. That was 50. That was 54 years ago, and I can remember it like it was yesterday, okay? Well, this loving God, <laughs> that it's his will that none should perish but all come to repentance, why would he make his son suffer the unspeakable things that he suffered to make a way for me to be, you know, reconciled to him, live my life in sin, and at the last minute go, you know what? I've wasted my life, but I'm about to die. And eternity is going to be a whole lot longer than what I've been living. I choose him now. Yeah. Yes, Lord, yeah. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Do you think God goes, oh, i got to think about that. Let me have a call a committee meeting with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and talk about that for a minute because yeah. I, I just don't know. I mean, I, I've asked him a hundred million times in the last 70-something years what you see, you yeah. know, and religion would want to just say, oh, I just don't know if that can, I believe it. I believe that God looked over at Jesus and punched you, you know, this is just me. You know, I don't mean this disrespectful, but I just believe God reaches over and just punches Jesus, you know, with his right elbow and, gets, and goes, hey, we finally got him. <laughs> we finally got him. Man, it took that long, but we finally got him. Told you so. Told you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, would you mind leading us in a simple prayer for those who may listen to this and may not yet know Jesus Christ and the goodness of God and the love demonstrated through Christ on that cross. Uh, would you mind praying with him? Sure. Would love to. Yeah. 
And if, you know, if anything we've been saying has, has been something that, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit's used that to, uh, you know, to cause your heart to say, you know, I, re I really do want him. I really do want him. I, I know religion has done such a terrible job of misrepresenting him, but I, and somehow in my heart, I feel like he's real. I feel like he's speaking to me now. I'm just going to pray this prayer as if I were you. Pray this prayer like I did when I was six years old. And if you, and if you really uh, want to know him, you, you want a salvation that not only forgives you of your sins, but frees you from your sins and can keep you in him, not only for him to be your Savior, but to be your Lord, uh, then you just, you just pray this prayer. Just say amen to it. Just agree to it. Just, um, just repeat it as I pray it. Well, Lord, we just, in Jesus' name, I, I thank you that you sent your Son, Father, that you sent Jesus and that he died. Yes that he suffered, that he bled, that he took all of the sins of all mankind for all time, that he took all of the pain uh, that we suffer in our mind and our emotions when he took that crown of thorns, that he took the stripes on his back for the healing of our body, that you provided a finished work of redemption, spirit, soul, and body. Yes. I thank you that you provided that. And today I just choose you. I choose to turn my life over to you. I choose to hand you what I have, as, as, as little as it may seem to me, as unworthy as I might even think that I am, I know that your love and your mercy and grace gives me the ability to do this. And so I choose to say, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Yes. Cleanse me from my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Raise me from spiritual death into life in Christ, Amen. that I can be alive in Jesus and him alive in me, that it can be no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. And I just give you my past, I give you my sin, I give you my failures, but I also give you my future. And I ask you to come live inside of me, live through me, and that I can live for you and with you and in you and spend eternity with you. I accept you. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord of all, that he was raised from the dead, that God raised him from the dead and has seated him at his right hand. And I accept you, Jesus, as Lord of all, but also as Lord of me. Amen. And thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer, we welcome you to the family of God and urge you to find a place that teaches you about Jesus Christ, that he came in the flesh, and that he lived a sinless life, and that he went to that cross for you, and that he was resurrected on that third day. Amen. Thanks again for tuning in. Before we leave, I want to ask Don, how do people get in touch with you? Um, well, if you'll send up a hot air balloon with a note attached to it. And semaphores and, from and, a high place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my website is down right now being kind of reconstructed and everything. But yeah, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, you can email me at don at donchanel.com. And that's C-H-A-N-N-E-L-L. -L. And, um, and so you can, you can shoot me an email there if you'd like to. And if you'd like to check with me on, uh, on social media, um, you can go to my Facebook page and, and do that and, and uh, shoot us something. Or you can get in touch with Daryl and... Uh, through this ministry, and he can pass the word along. And so that's probably the easiest way right now that we can get up and running again in a couple of months on the website. And which will be, by the way, when it's back up and running, the website is donchanel.com. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much for the opportunity and taking the time out of your schedule to uh, let me come over here and bend your ear. Hey, yes, sir. It's been some great conversation. Yes, sir. And uh, we'll see what God does. Always enjoy sitting down and talking with you, Daryl. All right, man. Until next time, thanks for tuning in. The truth is spoken.